Ok, bom dia. Eu vou só apresentar uma desculpa, porque eu sou português, mas vou apresentar em inglês. Uh, por duas razões. Primeiro, porque eu tenho a apresentação em inglês e o meu pensamento está todo em inglês. E eu não acho que eu, eu já vou acelerar em inglês, portanto, se eu tivesse que acelerar em português, ainda seria um bocadinho mais trágico. E, portanto, o que eu quero apresentar aqui é uma, uma visão alternativa para, para Portugal e para a tecnologia, para toda uma, uma, uma linha de, de, de assuntos que eu acho que estão muito atualizados. E, portanto, são, são muito atuais. Portanto, vamos, vamos começar. Eu peço já desculpas pela aceleração. E... <risos> And for, a, for the large amount of content I'm going to throw at you. Um, and, uh, and the final thing is I, I find myself today professionally in a very nice position because I have a big mandate and I work for different companies, but I'm not an employee of those companies, so I can say exactly what I believe. And that's exactly what I'm saying here. This is a very interesting presentation because I have no agenda. I'm literally presenting what I generally believe is the best solution for the problem. And you'll see because some of these ideas sound very radical, But given 2016, right, and I live in London, right, so I do have personal experience with 2016, I don't think we can say that, you know, anything is not possible and unprecedented and change is something that it's really on the cards these days. So let's start with this, right? So by the way, there's a, actually, there's a much bigger version of this online. It's Creative Commons. Everything is there. You can reach it there. It's on GitHub. You know, it's kind of all available. So it, there's actually a couple of more, even more crazy ideas there, which I didn't have time to, to put in. So feel free to join in. So, So let's start with this, right? So what I, the view here is that I think we want to make Portugal a global player in software development, right? That's basically the key. We, we want a situation where as technology becomes more important to our society, we really want to make sure that we take it seriously and that Portugal becomes a, a big player in, in that world, right? And I view application security as a very powerful enabler of that situation. And application security sits in a very, very interesting way because application security tends to be the, sometimes the only ones that really ask how things work. What happens? What's the attack surface? What really is going on in the applications? And everything is related. So when you start with the application, you go all the way in a way to the microchip, right? Because everything is related to what's going on on that particular website. And these days, everything is connected to the internet. So in a way, everything is connected to some kind of to do with application security and code. Right? So I'm going to provide a lot of paths, a lot of ideas, a lot of stuff to actually make this and, you know, to make this first class citizen. So the first, and this is probably the key core idea that I try to come up with all sorts of ways to represent a good path. And I, I found this one because I think it's, it fits all the political government, you know, companies, educational, uh, things together. So I think we need to make the Portuguese network hostile to insecure code. Right? So we want a situation where we are allergic to basically the situation where somebody can just publish and put insecure code into our network. Right? And I, by, by, by my network, I mean Portugal. Right? And, and you can actually do the same thing for companies. So a company can decide to do the same thing. This presentation is focused on the country, but you know, Microsoft could decide to do the same thing. You know, a lot of companies do a bit of this, but it's nice when it's a global agenda. Also because Portugal has sovereignty over our network. Right? Although we're part of the European Union, a lot of stuff, there's lines, there's borders that we can actually control, and it's time to bring the digital world into that. So I, my view is that everything I'm saying here is fair game in Portugal. Others might not like it, fine, but we can define our own rules, right? Um, so, and this needs to be supported by collaborative commons. Well, there's commons, commons, there's a little mistake. Um, and, uh, and if you don't know that term, it's a really great concept. I'll explain a little bit, but it's a, it's a very interesting way of working together. In, in, a, in, a, in a kind of way that makes a lot of sense. So uh, you need strong enforcement, you need regulation, you need market pressure to make this work. So the way you want to do is you want to attack vulnerable code. So I want this situation where vulnerable apps and appliances, as soon as they plug to our network, they should be hacked within minutes, right? Some of the best security teams in the planet, they hack internally. You develop a, an application in a company, and if your app is not to a certain level of security, a certain level of resilience, it will be attacked, not by the attackers, but by your own teams. And that's what you want. Right? You want a situation where basically uh, it's hacked by the good guys. Oops, sorry. They're hacked by the good guys, which are basically trying to help it, to fix it, or by disable it. Right? And this is something that when I presented at um, the OWASP conference here, and I said, let's hack Portugal, we're still a shock. Now, five years later, with the ideas of the bug bounties and all that stuff, this starts to be common sense. Right? 
So um, we need a mandate from government, and this makes, it has to be important because you have to have some kind of mandate for the kind of stuff. And you also need to have a situation where, um, in, you know, in, in, in some way, the manufacturers give us this mandate because they publish insecure stuff. So the way I look at it, if you're a manufacturer, you publish insecure code, so you, you're already giving us permission to compromise it and to fix it and to attack it, right? And, and you kind of need some insurance on this because we will break some devices, right? So you kind of need to support this a little bit by uh, some insurance not covered. This is actually a very key important point, right? We have to make sure that the next generation of internet users, including my kids, right? And is that they don't have fear of the internet, right? So we have a situation where I don't want them to fear the internet. I don't want them to fear to govern their actions because we did that with terrorism and you can see what created it, right? You have a complete irrational conversation about the, the real problems. So we don't want the same thing to happen in security. Right? We, I don't want the first experience with these guys to be a hacked doll, a light bulb, a website, email accounts, a car, the door asking for some ransomware to be paid. This is already not science fiction, by the way. Right? And it's only going to get worse. We don't want this world because this world will create a much bigger problems than we have now. Right? So before I continue, I think it's, it's better important to give a good disclaimer of what I mean by hackers and by hacking. Right? Um, basically, the hackers are the good guys. Right? The hacking created the internet. It's basically, uh, hack is to solve problems. Right? This is what we were doing in the University of Algarve. Right? We learned the internet by hacking to the internet. I blew up my mom's phone system because I was trying to plug the modems to it, you know, was it 2,400 bots or whatever I think it was? Right? But that's how you learn. You improvise. You learn. You hack. Right? That's what it is. Right? Um, the press abused the term hacker, right? And I, they should really be talking about things like malicious hackers, cyber attacks, cyber criminals, because that's a much better term. So the way I look at it is that everything you do today on the internet was created uh, and dreamed by hackers in the past, right? So when I talk about hacking, I'm talking about on this definition of hacking, right? And um, the other thing that's great about hackers is they have great values, right? You have a very strong ethical foundation based on sharing, respect, friendship, uh, trust, um, one more, non-discrimination, human compassion, right? This is not, you know, fluffy things, right? This is not, oh, this is nice to live in this world. When you're in a hacking community, when you're in that community of sharing information, this is what you do. You know, I don't care what color of skin you have. I don't care, you know, what you are, where you are, where you come from, your history. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we share the same passion for the same problem. Right? When we had the summit here in Portugal, you had people from competing companies all working together to solve a common problem. That's what you want. Right? And that's what the hacking, in a way, brings in. I think we need to bring that community to a country and to etc. We want to inspire the next generation with these values. And it's important to have frames of reference. The thing that I find sometimes you don't have sometimes in Portugal, I'd say even companies, not just Portugal, is sometimes you have professionals that don't have frames of reference. They have not seen it working. So it's very hard to visualize how you can do something when you never experienced those things. You have that with DevOps. You have now with deployment, with coding. You know, you have management guys who never experienced a really powerful uh, software development environment or a really powerful secure environment that creates even faster code and even better code. So you, if you don't experience that, you really cannot ask for it. So we need to provide these alternative narratives to the current mainstream of lies, non-expert experts, and it's not experts welcome, which is one something that happened in UK a little bit, and infotainment, which we just saw this week with the kind of you know global elections, right? Uh, this is the new reality that we have, right? <laughs> so we need to create our future, and you have to remember that the the hackers that grow up creating distributing, for example, systems to attack the network, and as part of, for example, of the PT hacking service, which I get into a second, are the same ones that will find really powerful solutions for Portugal. For example, why don't we have a distributed peer-to-peer -peer drone network to combat fires in Portugal, right? This is a great use to, to do the use of technology. We can create cryptocurrencies. We can create all sorts of stuff, but it's that generation that would do it, right? The same generation that was hacking Linux boxes, right, while we were in university campus, right, is the same generation that's today is solving fundamental problems. So we need to make sure that this new generation knows what a Raspberry Pi is, knows what's inside knows how to build one. There's a factory in Portugal. You can build that stuff, right? This is what we want, right? You want to be different, and just because 99% of the world doesn't do something doesn't mean you should do it. 
I lost count how many times people tell me that I'm the only one guy who wants to do this, or it's only you, Dennis, and now it's never going to work. And then eventually things change, right? So, so again, it's important to do it, right? And remember that most of the things you value today were actually illegal and immoral sometime in the past. So it's very important to remember that when we think something's a bit weird today, a lot of the stuff we take for granted were actually really problematic and controversial in the past. So attacking Portugal, you know, um, I actually don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I don't want to spend time on the problem. If you don't, if you don't believe this is a problem, then you know, it's a different discussion. Uh, just basically some interesting numbers that I managed to f to get from you guys. Uh, that's a million point five um, records on databases, a lot of companies leaked, etc. This is quite interesting. These guys, are these guys here, anybody from here? These guys, this actually is awesome. Actually, I have to say this is actually brilliant, right? It'd be nice to even go another level. And by the way, you guys should have crazy funds from the Portuguese government, and others, to do this. Right? So it's one of those cases you probably are, you know, a company this big and you should be that big, right? Because this stuff, right, is absolutely critical for what's coming next, right? In fact, actually, that's quite interesting. Since you're here, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll mention something in a second. So they found these cool attack vectors. So this is how you can blow up a country, right? Like, you know, the idea that, you know, a country is safe is totally crazy when you have stuff like this, right? The amount of damage you can do in a country if you decide to be malicious, I can ask you, right? If you guys were really pissed off at Portugal, how much damage could you do? But there you go, right? And, and it's crazy, right? This, this, this used to be funny five years ago. It's not funny anymore, right? Especially when government agents and criminals are really stepping up. And, and again, if you look at the geopolitical move of the world, you know, I think it's time for us to control our technology, right? So there you go. You know, this is like basic stuff. This is like hacking, you know, like it's 2000, right? So, and remote control systems, scatter stuff, things with, you know, clear text protocols, you know, and then of course the web apps are even worse, right? But if you guys don't cover that, you should really be covering the applications. You should have a mandate to hack everything that moves, which I'm sure you don't, right? And, and I'm sure that anybody threats to loss, to loss you, you guys are screwed because you're not that big, right? But if somebody says, yeah, it's cool. so can you sue Portugal because they gave me the mandate, right? That's a different mandate, right? So, um, and again, the, the, the latest DOS are very interesting, right? Because you have to remember that these denial of service are done against some of the biggest companies in the planet and they are not surviving. I'm involved in a company that we got hit by the crossfire, right? It's not, we're not even the target, but we just got hit just because we were sharing some of the networks and sharing Akamai and sharing some of those guys. We actually had, we lost money because of these things. And we're not even targeted. And if this guy's pointed out to us, we had no chance, right? Uh, to deal with this kind of stuff, right? So we're not, we have to remember, right? Is that it doesn't take a lot of money to compromise a country or a company. This is, it's actually out of date, but this is the cost of a zero day. This is the worst case scenario to take to compromise um, a particular company, right? So, so basically with this, you know, if I had $100,000 to invest, what would I do? I'll buy a bunch of zero days, right? I'll buy compromised machines inside the Portuguese network. I'll buy botnets to attack Portuguese companies, right? And basically, how much money can I make out of it? If I can make a million pounds out of it, it makes business sense because it's all about the money. Right? That's what I need to think about. If there is a million dollars to be made in a particular company, somebody will be able to put a hundred grand into it to invest. Right? The good news for us is the attackers are making far too much money doing other stuff, right? But they grow it, right? But we get there. And again, what's the return on investment? And who actually can survive this stuff? And I, my view is very little companies, right? Especially in Portugal, we will to survive this kind of stuff, right? So we already had actually a massive market hack. Because I would argue that Portugal has already been victim to financial manipulations. Looking from the outside, knowing some people on the financials that I know, they were totally playing with Portugal, right? They, you know, I know some guys that their best fund return investments were the Portuguese debt, right? In other words, hey, let's put a lot of money on the Portuguese debt because we know those guys will never go into default. And let's push the rates up because we know it's going to be safe, right? You know the system is wrong. This is hacking, right? But the financial markets, right? And we know, and, and you guys live with the day-to-day -day consequences of this that was done to us, right? So um, basically, they push it hard. They make a lot of money that Ben was not going to default, and he didn't, right? Be and, and would continue to struggle, right? So that's the problem. The other thing that is very, very important when you look at from the attacking point of view, just to end on this, is if they tell you about the attack, right? And I know it might be painful when it's a leak or a document, whatever, but when the attackers actually physically let you know that they did something, right? They are your best friends and you have to tank them because they will make you better from a security point of view because the criminals will not tell you. The criminal's business model is based on you not knowing that they're there, right? So the reality is that 
once you know about the attack, you're going to fix it. The security team is going to get a much bigger budget, right? We're going to be able to protect all these other things that we would love to do, but nobody was paying attention. Now, suddenly, it's a massive priority, right? So ultimately, every time there's a public attack, the outcome is always tends to be net positive unless they are criminals, unless they have malicious intents. Then it's a completely different problem. A kid that breaks into a network and dumps everything, you should hire him, right? Which is what we're doing now in a way with the bug bounties, right? On this. So again, the positive side effects of all that stuff is that you basically get better teams, better stuff, and that's what happens, right? So how secure is Portugal, right? How secure is our infrastructure and companies? And we have very digital company, you know, operation stuff, and if you look at operate, most of them run on software. So Portugal is already one of those countries that already runs on software, probably has not realized that it runs on software. I, I challenge you to find one company in Portugal, even from the most traditional you know, thing that exists in here, right? That actually does not depend on software for their livelihood, for their sales, for their management, for their purchases, for their everything. And if they do, their, their efficiency is very low, right? So everything's on software, right? And the question, how secure are they? How, you know, how can they sustain attack? How can they detect possible attacks? And what's the probability of an attack happening in the short term? So in a way, how secure are we, right? So how safe? So the question is, we are very safe. And I was actually trying to find this word in Portuguese, and I couldn't. So maybe we can talk, some of you can tell me in the end. I couldn't find the difference in Portuguese between safe and secure. In England, it exists. In Portuguese, I couldn't find it because it's, it's seguro, right, in both of them, right? So, but he, we, are we safe today? Yes, we are safe, right? Do I use the internet? Do I use my card? Am I comfortable knowing that in principle I'm not going to be hacked now by a criminal? I'm pretty safe, right? And I know what the end of the belly looks like, right? So if anybody should be paranoid, it should be me, right? But are we secure? No, we're massively insecure, right? Because our current um, secure state, right? The fact that we are secure, right? So uh, our, our current security state depends on a very low number of attackers with few, few skills and unsophisticated business models, right? And this is important to understand. And this is ma major companies in the planet. Right? It's not just Portuguese companies, but although I think here we, we're going to be caught by the crossfire. Right? So the bottom line is that we're not attacked because we are secure. We're not attacked because there's not enough attacking. Right? But it's important to acknowledge this, because then we can start to look at better solutions for that. Right? So the emperor has no new clothes. So Portuguese game managers are not secure. Just you know, if you want the headline, there it is. Right? And what we need to accept as a fact for what's coming next to look less radical. Right? So, um, there's, and also very important, there's no silver bullets or easy solutions. There's a lot of people who want to sell big, lovely buttons and big stuff. That doesn't exist, right? What we have is, um, all this evolution, right, is about, you know, we, we need to figure out all these paths to go through. So, the logic of this presentation is to make Portugal a player versus being a played. We want to be a senior player on a table. We want to control the game. We want to define the rules of the game versus just being a pawn into whatever the, the game is being played, right? And, um, and if, if we need to prepare what's coming next, especially in terms of AppSec, right? And our, our response to terrorists shows how bad you, these can do if when the problems occur, you're not ready, you don't have a plan, you don't have alternative rea reality. And society is not strong. Not being funny, but the reaction to Sweden, to the terrorist attack that happened there versus the reaction to some other countries, it's a massive difference. So you can see the value, right, of having a very strong, Society has thought about these things, right? Think I'm wrong? Fine. Protect, prove me wrong. Where's the evidence? Where's the cybersecurity market in Portugal, which I believe is very, very small, right? How many threat models are created per week? How many secure lines of code are, right? Basically, I, I like to word this, this phrase a lot. The, the current security model is based on magic fairies pixie dust. Hey, it's cool. It's like quality, right? It somehow automatically becomes secure, right? That's not reality, right? The good news is you have a lot of talent, which I want to get in. So again, you save, right? And at the moment, although we're highly secure, we're quite safe, which is cool, right? But it also means we have a bit of time to deal with this stuff, right? So, and there's not enough attackers, so basically we have a couple more years. So let's basically now look at the solutions for these things, right? So, um, uh, and I also like this just for a point. We, you, the best security model, and I call this sane security model, is not a security model based on having no vulnerabilities, no insecurities, no um, API dependencies or no zero days. That doesn't exist in the real world, right? The security model is based on the attacker making a mistake. Because all attackers make mistakes, right? Even guys like the NSA or whoever created the Stuxnet, right, which is still not officially, you know, acknowledged, they made mistakes. They crashed. 
one odd little box that was running on an odd you know, antivirus and that unraveled the whole thing, right? And that's your security model. Now the question is, can you detect those? Do you understand your code? Do you understand your applications? Do you understand how everything works, right? That's why that is so critical. And that's your security model, not for, for Portugal, for any company, right? That's what you want to do, right? So where's our OPSEC industry? I don't think we have one really, right? Uh, it's, it's very small. Uh, it's actually, a, uh, I think it's a problem because I think we have a lot of talent, right? And, and you, you can see this because you see, every time you see an attack, you see an AppSec team, right? It's literally, you know, it's one to one, right? So I, I know this doesn't exist, right? In fact, I know a lot about Portuguese in the UK. I, today we're exporting AppSec talent to the UK, right? I actually work in London with a whole bunch of Portuguese guys, right? Um, I'm not going to name where I work at the moment because, you know, I don't want to get me in trouble, right? But, you know, there is a huge class community in Portugal, right? There. So we want to be proactive about this stuff, right? And it's actually very mature. And, and again, like, do you, do you want to be like the rest of Europe, be caught on a crossfire, or do you want to be actually proactive and create an industry that will be very powerful, but also very profitable? So this is what's cool. What I'm defending here can actually be really, really powerful and productive and profitable for Portugal. So it gives us jobs, gives all sorts of stuff and drive industry, right? And then we help the youth. So here's the first idea, right, for you. We should have the Portuguese hacking service. Right? So this is like we had the, this thing called the service notable obligatory, right? You guys probably remember some of these things, right? We need to do the same thing for hacking, right? We need to have this service where 15, 25 year olds go and freaking hack the country, right? Everything that has moved, hack companies, code review open source, code review markets as interested to Portugal, contribute to open source projects, right? This will be a spectacular learning opportunity, right? This would be a great use of talent, of users, creates a new generation that understands those things. Right? It doesn't cost any money. It's just political, right? It's just a decision. It's just a direction, right? But this will give us a lot of fuel, a lot of new things, right? And it also, I like this because it's almost like if you can't even stomach this idea, then, you know, that's fine. But this conversation will continue two years from now, right? Because it's not even that radical, right? But it feels radical because not a lot of people has done it before. But it's easy. We have the tradition, right? And we should do it. Right? So, uh, I, you know, the military, right? So I got this thing, right? I was looking at the thing and say, at the moment, we probably say that our cyber mode defense is as good as Portuguese military. The problem is the attackers are sophisticated as the best out there. So you have to imagine that, again, Portugal will be attacked by the equivalent of US and China, right? Or France in terms of the UK. And here's my question. Why do we need F-16s, right? So I went to the Portuguese Armed Force to try to figure out the thing, and I found that we have a nice F-16 fleet of stuff and all these guys. We have 2.1 billion turnover. Like, why does Portugal need an offensive force, right? Can you guys tell me, right, one scenario, right, that F-16s will actually come into play, right? Like, literally, give me a war scenario where we have uh, somebody attacking Portugal with our freaking F-16s, right? will actually, you know, do any value, right? So, I know, I, I understand to have a civil air force because we have fires, border control, but F-16s, come on. And by the way, the way you fight these F-16s these days is you hack into them, right? That's the way you defend yourself, right? So, in fact, if you haven't read this book, Ghost Fleet, I highly recommend because it shows how China theoretically took over the U.S. because, you know, it kind of compromised the whole thing, right? So. We can, if you use 10% of that budget, right, we can start a lot of things, right? Um, and so basically hit by the crossfire, talk about this, so as this came out thingies. So we should also have this Portugal Hackathon League where we should organize hackathons, right? Just like we do for football, it's like, you know, we should bring our PT DEFCON things, you know, PT hacking things to DEFCON. It should be a source of pride. Right? The same way that when we ran the football, which was great, right? Really cool. We should be celebrating when our guys go to DEF CON and become first or second over there, right? We should be a source of proud to actually have the best and most elite hackers. Because there is a connection to Portugal, right? There is a connection to your country. And that's where you really want to and be. So this is a source of pride. And then, you know, and they, and it's also a great way to learn, right? So a great source of talent, for example, and this is again, it's a bit controversial, is we should actually teach the convicted criminals how to hack, right? Because there's a lot of people that end up in prison for all sorts of reasons, right? And probably them, you would do the same thing if you had those circumstances, right? But there's a path today that we lose a lot of talent, right, to go into these guys. You know, they're already kind of already creative, right? Because to be fair, when you, when you rob something or when you're criminal, you actually get your head a bit different, right? So we just need to give those guys a little interesting path 
to use of their skills, right? So give them a career, show them the way to make money legally, right? Because it's actually legal to do this stuff. Teach them ethics. And most criminals are due to bad choices. So let's use that. A great sort of talent is retired people. Again, we lose them by not losing their experience. You know, in the past, they were the wise ones. We now ignore them, right? And remember, you'll be old soon. So it'd be nice if we can do this because by the time we get there, it'd be nice if we were respected and our ideas were still valued versus kicked out of society, right? Um, and the engineers, doctors, programmers, teachers, etc. right? So there's a lot of talent there, right? And, and remember that you grow old not because of your age, but because you stop mentally fit. So the great thing in technology, you can put everybody like this working together, including the dog, right? And it doesn't matter, right? As long as you work together, it's good, right? This is, again, a great vision for a society, right? So why is Portugal so good at football, right? I think it's a very interesting question because we are one of the best in the world, right? We are literally, you know, pushing above your weight. So why is that, right? And I think one of the reasons is because everybody plays football because our kids play it all the time. They love it, so they are in the zone, right? Because when you're in the zone is when you learn, right? We, in a way, we go to school to learn how to learn. We don't go to school to freaking remember, you know, all the historic facts and memorize formulas and the stuff that we did at university, right? It's ridiculous, right? My 13-year-old does more maths that are more complex than most of the stuff I program. Right? Never mind the stuff we had to do at university, right? So, you know, that's when you learn, right? And also, it's support by school activities. There's a social reward from the community. There's a support system to find that talent. There's massive financial rewards, right, for that stuff, right? So that's what we want to do. So let's do the same thing for hacking, right? Everybody can hack. Oh, sorry, that was a bit like, okay, I got like this. Everybody can hack. The kids should be hacking all the time. They will love it because they're in the zone. We support this activity. We should have like this, like capture the school flag, right? Like if you can freaking own the school network, you should be celebrated, right? Because if you can change your grades, great, you get another 10%, right? Just for that. That's cool because that's how you learn. But you should be rewarded. You shouldn't be seen as criminals. Doing that creates a, a generation that views hacking as bad. We should be celebrating those stuff. Right? And uh, social rewards, network to find them. And of course, this massive reward system. These days, if you're into secure AppSec, you know, we have, uh, there's a guy, you know, yesterday I was talking about, we have 0% unemployment rate, right? In AppSec, right? You know, it's just, you can't hire them, right? But in fact, if you guys are a good AppSec, I have three companies in the UK that will hire you today, right? You just need to know how to program, be a good AppSec guy, and that's it, right? You know, there is really a massive shortage. So let, let's do the same thing for this. So, we have a great tradition of innovations, right? Even things that maybe you don't realize, things like multi bunko right? Prepaid mobile phones, all the kind of stuff, all the way to these great little past. We have a great tradition of being innovators, right? We, this is a great success story. I don't know how much you guys realize this, but this is, you know, this was one of the cases that I read about Portugal in a very positive way. This is Portugal leading the way. Why? Because we had the balls to make a really good decision, right? To treat um, drugs as a public health problem, not a criminal problem. Right? And you could see, so this means that we are 10 times more clever than companies in the world that declare war on war, war on drugs, right? Which clearly doesn't work, right? And UK here doesn't have a good track record, right? So Portugal is a leader, right? When we're able to make good decisions, right? So that's what we want to do. We want to be, be a leader on application. We want the best in the world, right? There we are. There's the Portuguese dudes, right? There's our eighth in the world, right? Just like football, we want to be the best in the world in, uh, you know, in coding and cybersecurity and application security, right? That's what we want to be, right? And to be at SEC, we basically have a great history of providing this kind of stuff. So basically, you know, the same way that we navigated the seas in the past, right? We now, you know, should be leaders in the code, right? If you compare it to our, you know, forefathers in the 15th century, I think it would be a bit more scary when you thought that on the other side, there was like, you know, all sorts of really dangerous and crazy stuff. You even don't know if the earth would fall to the other side, right? So I think, you know, we are a bit more cozy, right? In, in our little problems today. Right? So, um, that's the thing. And also, we have a great tradition of innovation and all this kind of stuff. Right? So, I think code made in Portugal is very important. We need to create all this supply chains, right? That exists in Portugal. And basically, because they, that's where you add value, right? And they create reality. So, basically, they control our lives, right? So, it's key for our economy and it's key to actually encourage what is actually going on here, right? And we're living on this age of sustainability. I don't know how much you guys be following this kind of stuff, but we're moving to a world where factors are coming locally. You know, the whole dynamic of work is actually changing. Uber is a warm up for the uh, social and financial changes that are happening in our society. The question is, do we want to lead it or do you want to be, again, crossed by the crossfire? Right? Just for the guys who are developed stuff, I have to put some geek stuff on this, so let's just do it. If this is the kind of what I call secure activities, security champions. That's the mug, right? If you don't have a security champion in your team, get a mug, right? Because that's, it's better the mug 
a stack overflow, you need to go review secure coding standards, AppSec pipelines, two release pipelines, do threat models per app feature and layer. That's the kind of stuff you guys should be doing. And uh, again, if you develop it today not in, and you're not thinking in terms of CI automation, everything is code, 100% code coverage, uh, graphs, containers, version control, AI, cloud, blah, 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 you're already li writing legacy code, right? You like to slag off the other project over there because they're legacy, guess what? If you're not doing this, you're already a legacy in your own world. Right, um, And also, if you're doing JavaScript, for example, and you're not using Wallaby, and you don't have real-time code coverage, you're really in the dark age. And I have a couple of other presentations on that. If you guys are interested, I really strongly advise you guys to take a look at it. Right, And you can't code TDD until you have those things. So I really like this public health analogy. Right, So what this is, is um, we need to choose the paradigm for AppSec or, or cybersecurity that we want. And the paradigm is either going to be based on the military, top-down control, offensive, or the public health, defensive and distributed. This is very important because this determines which point we're going. There's, in fact, the US, UK, and other countries, they are totally going the military way, right? Again, we can change that. And there's a reason, for example, why you don't let the army involve in your country, right? Because the army, which is the military, right, in a lot of ways, is designed to, to defend against our enemies. So any, everybody is a, an attacker from an army point of view. Right? Which is why when the US Army went to defend Katrina was a horror show, right? Because for them, the guys on the other side are criminals, right? Or attackers, right? The police and civil forces focus on protecting individuals. That makes a big difference. So we have a massive public health problem. We should be thinking, training up sex, uh, you know, specialists in a way we do nurses, etc. We already have an epidemic, right? And we need to gain immunity. That's really what we want to do, right? And basically, the decision we make in the next couple of years will determine how well prepared. Doesn't mean that we won't have problems. It means that at least we are prepared, right? And that's what we need to think about. Insecure code is the epidemic that's already amongst us. Privacy is very important. It's actually a human right. You all should be innocent until proven guilty. The USA and the NSA redefined the notion of, of privacy, which was really bad. They went from this idea that when, you know, you look at something, if you're invading somebody's privacy to just, it's only, so when you, to, when you capture information to when you look at it. So what happens is they, the, the reasoning is I can capture everything about any of us, but it's only when they look at the data, when they do a search or something, that it actually become a potential invasion of privacy, right? Which of course is totally crazy, right? It just justifies that stuff. So we need to change that, right? And there's a huge amount of companies that their entire business model depends on us not having privacy, which is a problem because it influences a lot of decisions, et cetera. And governments are now actually actively making the internet less secure because they want to continue to access that stuff, which is not a big problem. So, you know, it used to be that you only have to defend against criminals. Now you have to defend against even governments and other things that actually don't want you to fix problems, right? So crypto, again, is, private, is essential for this because privacy is essential for human dignity. And it's, in a way, cryptography is a public service, right? And it's crucial to protect user data. We really need to embrace it much better and do it, right? And it also has a great tradition of not relying on security by obscurity because I think that's very important, right? So great crypto should be seen as a good thing, should not be sued, right, by some entity who says, oh, please don't make these devices so secure that I cannot break them, right? Which again is wrong, right? So um, whistleblowers very quickly, we need disclosure to, to, this, to talk about this stuff. The market at the moment doesn't really work, right? So whistleblowers are actually very important, right, to, to this kind of stuff. And again, if Portugal, EU doesn't like it, we should sue the EU, you know, it's time for us to actually push some stuff. And this all comes down to the way of sovereignty, right? We need to control the stuff that happens within our country. For example, we should have very, very powerful whistleblower laws that allow people to disclose what's going on in the software that happens in here, right? Because the reason they're important is because they will make our market more efficient. They will basically, um, have the situation where they will keep the companies honest, right? And there's a, uh, a, a great thing that when everything is a secret like we have now, nothing is a secret, right? So, so this is very important for the concept. And you need to protect them by law, right? And you also need to say that, you know, I like this idea that if you break a law, but the Trump's committed to disclose the materials are smaller than what was disclosed, it's okay, right? And yeah, people don't like it, but the companies didn't like, you know, stuff in the past, that's okay. The other, on the other hand is, when I say that, you know, we want total privacy for the individual. We want no privacy for companies and governments, right? So, and that's the game. The game is openness. The game is that what we want is to understand what's going on, right? So they public bodies, they should actually uh, be completely open and allowed, and technology allows this for that to occur, right? So let's learn from the music industry that basically saw the users as their, the problem and start to basically sue everybody, right? So let's learn from those guys, right? Because that didn't work very well. 
um, and we lost a decade, right? So open source is actually the key for all this, right? And I'm a very firm believer in open source, but not as open source software is great, but the model, the values, the workflow that you get with open source, right? So the way I look at it is that most of the ideas here, if you don't do this in, the, in a very strong open source and creative commons way, it will not work. You actually backfires. You actually will create a command and control system, right? Which is kind of where we're going now anyway, right? So open source, I provide these OWASP, if you guys know, it's a great organization on the governance, it's all the stuff. And, um, and also Git is a great part of this because it gives you uh, some workflows. Open source values, again, we talk about this, they empower the stuff, this is all the stuff you do with open source, and it's all positive, right? It's all great stuff. Doesn't mean code is perfect, but it's a great model. Well, open source is expensive, again, you have to realize that we need companies that sell open source code. We, what we don't want is the lock-in, and of course, open source code is not free, as in beer, there's a cost, right? The difference is you pay a bit differently, and you need to pay for it, right? Because um, it's a much better model, right? We have a market of lemons, if you guys know the analogy from the cars in the past, right, where the current economic model doesn't really work, doesn't really work, companies to create security um, issues, so we actually need this. So I think open source should be the lingua franca for all this stuff, because it actually gives us, um, you know, the, this, this workflow where, you know, we actually communicate with using open source, right? So, uh, so this guy, now, now here comes the, the nice, interesting, more radical ideas, right? We should, every code that's written and paid by government agencies should be released under open source license. There's no reason why something that we pay as a taxpayers actually release under proprietary stuff, right? Should all be open source. All documents created by government should be Creative Commons, right? Companies, Portuguese companies should actually publish their codes and license and the create stuff and actually should pay for open source, which actually takes a financial model to understand that. Right? That, that will create a massive difference. That will create hundreds or thousands of companies just supporting open source in Portugal. Right? Now, this is quite interesting, right? Because uh, we can actually take this other way. And I was thinking, how do you see this? Well, look, you can create a fund, right? You can create a venture capital fund in Portugal that buys the Portuguese companies that create software oops, and, uh, and basically um, and open source their code. Right? That's totally possible. It exists. Right? It's not a problem at all. Right? Um, you just do that, and they can use that money to actually figure out how to do it, right? So they wrote it, etc. But this will this will have a massive bottom line impact, sorry, on Portuguese economy because you have all this software written in Portuguese that's now freely available without being locked in by the vendors, right? So 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 the government has a big responsibility in this, right? And and basically. Um, and the vision uh, applies this, and there's this thing about collaborative commons, which I, I don't have time to go into, but you, you guys should really definitely explore it, right? Um, and basically, the role of the government is basically to, to be uh, not command and control, but a benign force, right? And the key thing is code is law, right? So software is made of codes, and code controls Portugal, so Portugal controls the evolution of the software we use, so let's take, let's take back control, right? So who controls the world? Well, it's dominated by these guys, right? Finance, technology, networks, intellectual property. We are not any players there, so what we need to do is we need to change the rules of the game, right? When you're a player that is fighting or playing a game that is not in your favor, then the best way is not to be better than those guys at that game, the best way is to change the rules of the game, right? Which we can do because we have sovereignty, right? So if you move to open source values and activities, then we'll be able to do this kind of stuff. So the governments can make a difference because they exist to serve us. So, you know, we should be requesting those guys to do this. And basically, we are two degrees of separation away from people that can actually do these things, right? Uh, I also don't believe on big changes. I believe on interactive and exponentiality changes. So you start small, you, you build, 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 just like we build software now. Right? So again, anybody who sells a big expensive solution is selling a scam, right? It's small changes, start small, deploy, learn it, make changes, go back to step two and repeat, right? That's how you build society. That's how you make changes. In fact, on a country and, and, and a thing. So we should have a ministry of code, right? We should have a ministry in Portugal that cares about software, right? They, they, everything is code. So basically, you know, it's managed at a higher levels within the government. We have, should have a Portuguese CTO and a CISO. We should have things like Code for Portugal, which is based on Code for America, which is a really cool idea. Grassroots. They should manage the Portuguese hacking service. They will commit to only buy commission in these applications that have released their code in open source. They have their schemas and all restrictive licenses, right? That's what we want, right? We also, you know, and then they manage the bug bounty stuff. We should, we could have the Clean Software Act, right? And basically, this is basically one like the Clean Air Act that we had in the past that says now we're going to have code quality built in is is a requirement, right? We did we done this for pollution. We can do the same thing for code, right? And and again, there's a great phrase that says it's very difficult to get a man to understand something when their salary depends on their not understanding it. So yes, there's a lot of people who don't like these ideas, but you know they'll adapt, 
right? So that's not a problem, right? We should have the Software Testing Institute, right? And this is not stuff that Portugal will do for itself. We can sell this. These are billion dollar markets that exist today that we should be key players on it. Right? We should have basically measure or visualize the side effects of code. We need to focus on quality services. Right? We can adopt testing as a way to leapfrog these things. Right? Testing Institute allows us to measure this and allow it to create an insurance world, which is where you're going next. Maybe you have ASI for code, right? And I know ASI has a really, really bad reputation in Portugal, but it's also a warning sign, right? Because when regulation loses the plot, which is what we had in Portugal, right? You, you know, we need to learn it, right? You know, ASI had a massive loss of common sense, right? Yes, they're secure, and there's things they've been doing for tradition generations that maybe it's okay to keep doing it like that, right? But that's what happens when you get too much regulation that doesn't understand on the bottom line, which is to make you empowerment, good behavior, common sense, right? That's what we want. Right? So, you know, we need a Portugal wide bug bounty where everything is hackable, right? And you get paid for it, right? And there's bug bounties everywhere. The panic has a bug bounty. Where is it? I actually tried to find a bug bounty for a Portuguese company. I couldn't find one. I'm, probably there is one, but they're not really that well known. That just shows you, right? And again, you crowdsource a solution and leave it like that. Insurance, it's a massive industry, right? This is one of the keys to AppSec because insurance wants data. We could be creating that data. Our Institute of Quality, Institute of Software Testing, they generate data that the insurance guys will consume. And then as long as we publish all these things, the model actually will work quite nicely, right? And then companies will decide to run a secure code, that's fine. Then the insurance is a good metrics to matter, right? So that's quite good, right? Now, the, the, the nuclear bomb here is we can also nationalize code, right? You know, and basically, you know, if a company is critical for Portugal and they don't want to disclose the code, guess what? If they want to operate in Portugal, we can nationalize it, right? Yes, it's the nuclear option, but it should be on the table, right? We cannot have black magic, right, running in our stuff, right? Everything, right, our data, it has to be everything, basically, I look at it, everything that touches Portuguese data and Portuguese networks and Portuguese lives has to be public, peer-reviewable, compilable by independent sources, right? Um, and signed, and basically this is not just websites, but IoT devices, network devices, microchip, everything, right? This is what we want to do, right? And, and it's important to understand that that's a red line that sometimes we cross for certain companies because the, 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 st the, the stakes of the game are that high. Again, European unity is great. I'm a strong believer in Europe. I love Europe, right? But Europe needs a reset, right, at the moment. I think, again, Portugal has a good experience of that, right? And we shouldn't have to beg to Europe to fund this stuff, right? I want Europe to sponsor this, to be involved, because they want to, because Portugal is the best place in the world to do this kind of stuff. We want it to be positive, not like, oh, you know, just throw me some bones here, right? Because that doesn't scale, right? And you're not in, in the power position to negotiate, which is what you really want, right? So that's what Europe should be about, collaborative commons, global village, right? This is the kind of stuff that we really want from to, to see, right? So we can even create a new currency, right? Hey, you know, p people complain about the euro, say it sucks, it's bad for selling euro, right? There's nothing wrong with, not now, we don't have the generation, but you know, give it a couple of years with blockchain technology, I'm not sure if you guys are involved in that, it's really powerful, right? You can explore all these business models, right? This is reality, right? Of course, you make it 100% compatible with the euro, and then, you know, and that could be created by the next generation of hackers, right? There you go. So why us, right? So you might think, why Portugal? Right? Why do you do these things in Portugal? Because ironically, it's actually easier here. Right? Like the drug stuff. It's easier to do this in a smaller country because there's less agendas, there's big lobbies, you'll be ignored for a while, which is great because you can actually make it work, right? Generate momentum. We have the power, it's already on our hands, right? So this is not, you, have to, you don't have to ask permission. You guys already know people that can make this happen, right? And, and by the way, this is where I could say, look, I would love to live in Portugal, I would love to come back to Portugal. Unfortunately, I don't, but this is a world I want to live in, right? But actually, you also need to fight for these things. Right? There you go. So uh, we need to raise the bar of discussion. It's very dangerous at the moment, the debate we have now. And we have a very strong sense of ethics, engineering, ability to solve problems. And we learn the hard way what's to be the junior player. Right? So there you go. We already hit the rock bottom. Right? So hey, the only way is up. So you might as well uh, do these ways. So we have some big questions. There's no perfect solutions on this. Right? Not all my ideas are perfect, right? but at least I think they step in the right direction. Right? And again, I found this thing. What's Portugal? It says we are great at graduating from high school. All right, that's quite cool, right? It's better than cork. I actually thought it'd be like something like cork or something like that, right? Or pastel is not right? But at least, right, we can do better, right? It should be craftsmanship, software, cybersecurity, secure coding, right? That's what you want to see there, right? We want to be the best at that stuff, right? So it's our turn to fight for these things. You know, our, our parents fought for fascism, racism, pension, women's rights, all that stuff, rock and roll, right? Including that kind of things. Right? It's our turn to do this, to balance the power. It's time to re readjust these things. And basically, it's the power is on who controls the network. It's time to change that. OK? 
Okay, so we have a, and, and also another little thing is we should export engineers, should form them. There's a whole bunch of slides I've been putting here about education, you can see on the website. I think that's key. We should be creating this whole generation of professionals and then send them to the world because they bring Portugal with them in their hearts, right? You, you, you don't, you, you can't experience how amazing it was to be in England to see Portuguese win the World Cup, so the European Cup, right? It's amazing, you know, the parties that they were there, they were fantastic, right? It's really nice. Nobody really, you know, um, you know, leaves Portugal, right? So they are ambassadors, they are clients, they connect to Portugal, and they're an asset to us, right? So, so again, and they'll come back one day and share what they've learned. They bring ideas, they bring stuff. So again, this is very key, right? So our duty is to protect the internet. The internet is one of the biggest, right, assets it gives to humanity. The first generation made it free and open, right? In, and the, the success of the internet is actually a testament to those decisions. Now is the time for our generation to do the same thing. We need to realign the internet, or else the internet for our kids is going to be very different. It's going to be command and control. It's not going to be open. It's not going to be free. And it's going to be a much a poorer, uh, in a lot of ways, society, right? So, uh, so here's the final concept, right? So what's the future for Portugal? Are we a garden for Europe, right? Are we a small pawn on a global force that control the world, or are we going to work with all other first and Portuguese speaking countries, and are we going to be a powerhouse that inspires and leads the world in technology? Okay, so let's sell the codes, right? And let's use code to create a generation of work ethics. Let's create new reality. So the same way that we once navigated, right, the sea, we should now do the same thing for digital code, right? And that's it. Thank you. Cool. And I think we have five minutes. I don't know. Any questions? No. <laughs> See, I have the independence. See, if I was, I couldn't say this stuff. Sorry? No, no, look, I, I, the way I look at it is that I, I think this is one of those things where, see, it, it, I view that's wrong, right? See, it's wrong to think that you need to be in power to do these things. Right? I, I think that's very important. The, the idea that only if you're in a position of power you can actually do things, it's very wrong. Because what happens is the current model, and we've seen recently, is so screwed that by the time you get to power, you lost so many values, you lost so many ideas, that you then have the power but don't know what to do with it. Right? And I found this in companies. Right? I found that the best place to be in a company is not at the top. It's at the place where you respect it. It's at the place where your opinion counts. But you have the independence to say, this is what I want to do. Right? So, all right, cool. Any other comments, questions? How do you think that we can convince people in the power to make this kind of bets? I think you should believe. So the, the, way, the way you drive change is you believe on it and you act on it. Rather, the others will do it. Right? And, and you'll find that the sphere of your influence is way bigger than you believe. So it's, there's, I think there was a great concept I said, it's like waiting for Superman, right? Same thing. If you wait for somebody else to make a decision, all you're doing is delegating your responsibility. You're saying, oh, well, I can do because that guy didn't approve it. Well, that guy didn't get it, right? So that's why it's wrong to do big changes. So the way you do big changes in society is exponentially. If you look at Git as a technology, it grew exponentially, not because Linus could have done this and he has enough power and said, I've developed this best you know, thing, source control in the world, everybody should use it. He said, hey, I use this, those things suck, this is great, if you guys like it, you should use it, right? And he developed something that worked for him. So I think it's, again, it's a mistake to, to think that you need permission to do these things, right? Because remember, like, one day, you will be in this position of power, right? Or you already know somebody who, that does this. So the question is whether you believe it or not, right? So I'm just showing you some interesting realities, right, of ideas that we can do. And hopefully, you know, some of you guys will, will take this on board and we continue the conversation. Or nothing happens and I'll come back three years from now and do a variation of this, right, and say, hey, guess what? The problem is worse, right? And maybe now, you know, there's some traction. So here's my contribution. So I finally feel I was able to contribute something to my country. Hopefully a little bit, but that's a nice step. All right. Cool, thanks guys.